Okay, yeah, perfect. Got... So uh, Dr. Patel at the last uh, session described how to do uh, percutaneous screws uh, fluoro-based, and then uh, as a comparison, we'll also show how easy it can be done with a uh, navigation and a more modern system. Um, I'll first just start off some simple techniques of uh, lumbar just as a comparison to what he just did, and we can show you how you can do this for more complex uh, anatomy, uh, such as uh, pelvic screws, S1 AI, S2 AIs, things like that if you need bailout options. Uh, so uh, just want to confirm you guys can see uh, these instruments that you can also see the, you can see the navigation screen as well. Uh, yeah, everything's very clear, and your audio is great too. So, can you explain uh, this navigation system? Just a, um, is there a yeah. camera associated with it, or? Sure. So right now, what we have done here is a little bit different workflow than what I would do in the OR. But we had a preoperative scan done of this torso, and what we did was we placed a spinous process patient tracker and uh, we register some fiducial points. So there's a few in more incisions than a typical case, um, and we use that as uh, reference markers so we can identify um, and confirm the accuracy of this navigation system. So when I placed it on this spinous process, I could check with the navigation that it's on the spinous process within you know, one, one to two millimeters of accuracy. Um, in the typical workflow in my OR, we would uh, do an intraoperative scan. Um, you know, there's various technologies, various companies that make different scanners, and then um, it's all integrated there and the registration, you, know, you can place that tracker on uh, right before the scan, and so it's automatic uh, registration ready to go, and you don't need to necessarily put one of these uh, additional stab incisions to confirm the accuracy. Another pro tip that I do is uh, to confirm that there's no shift or error uh, by accidentally knocking into the tracker, I typically place uh, a couple of skin staples uh, before the scan throughout the field, um, and then uh, when I start my procedure, I can check the accuracy of, of an instrument by placing it on a skin staple and making sure that it's showing up on the navigation that I'm right on the staple. Uh, so it's a great way to confirm the accuracy uh, throughout the case. Um, so again, now when you're using navigation, I try to use it for every single step. So for example, if we're trying to do a lumbar pedicle screw, I would plan my screw um, from the very beginning uh, from the incision. So right here, I would plan right here my incision. And you can tell that navigation is a little bit off here on this torso because we're, we're showing that we're already through uh, the skin here. But basically, um, I would ask my uh, imaging rep to place a trajectory. Perfect, like that. So I would plan my incision right there. I knew it does look like there's a registration error or at least a frame shift. Yeah, no, there uh, definitely to, is. There definitely uh, is. From are here. you going to be able to use this accurately as a good representation? I, I think in a, in a real life situation, obviously you'd re re register. Oh, totally. Yeah. yeah. So right now, this is uh, what we had um, set up. Um, so we'll just do it for to show the basic. But I would plan my incision there, and then basically the importance of the navigation uh, with the check is since you are not going to have the, the, the visualization, you want to just check for palpation. So right now I can feel that I am on bone there and knowing that it's inaccurate from there, we wouldn't start it in a real patient. But basically I would go here, find your trajectory where you want to go um, right here. And then from here we would, we would uh, cannulate that pedicle uh, we can drop a Y wire. Um, so we know, I know in the last talk, we talked about percutaneous screws with uh, some dangers with the K wires. Uh, so uh, one company makes uh, a, an alternative called a Y wire. I'm not sure if you guys can see this over here. And so basically it flares out uh, at the back end. So you would close this to fit it down, your uh, perk screw or your perk, uh, your your percutaneous uh, jam sheety. And then as it enters into the vertebral body, it would, it would open up. And then this provides a little bit more tensile strength, a little bit more resistance to avoid uh, plunging. 
um, as you're passing instruments. And similarly, as it gets locked into the bone, um, it also prevents it from uh, backing out as you're switching instruments also. So there's just a little safety feature, which I, so I, try, I tend to use this for most of my cases. Can I ask you uh, a, a question? When you're navigating your pedicle screws, do you use guide wires or do you not use guide wires? Uh, great question. So uh, depending on what system we're using, I often do drop pedicle um, K wires or this Y wire and then uh, tap over that. If we get to a point where um, uh, I have a fairly small screw, where uh, it's not, the, the diameter of the screw is not gonna be that different than, um, uh, than the jam sheeting needle just slightly up, then I may skip you know, tapping and whatnot. And so typically what I'll do with my uh, rep is, again, I'll tell him to save a projection there. So if you can imagine. And then um, if I go to the navigator's screw, um, you can essentially do this K wireless where we would get this ready to go. Again, I would check this on a, um, a bony prominence and then I would go down there and I can f you can palpate the hole that you created and this way you can completely avoid um, so, any K wire migration at all. Anu, can um, you just do that? I mean, it, it looks a little bit more accurate when you put the instruments in. Maybe, maybe you could just, just go through the process of cannulating yeah, a pedicle. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Let me and, do it. It may be very inaccurate, just as a warning. Um, can I get a mallet, guys? And then I can tell Dr. Park right now just, uh, just the feel of this. Is, it's definitely inaccurate, but just to give you an example. So you would advance that there. We can save that. So, so this is a navigated gem sheety. I, I mean, correct. There, it's a navigated gem uh, sheety. Other options like a navigated drill, you could maybe u utilize as yep. well. J just, just to discuss the range of options here with navigation. And then I would basically pass that Y wire through. Mm -hmm. Make sure it's locked into bone. Right. So advantage, clearly, uh, you don't have to wear lead for this, assuming accuracy is intact. And uh, the advantage of maybe not using a jam sheet is like if you have irregular bone, facet arthropathy, drilling through is just much more um, um, yep. straightforward. And then I would just keep going through. And then for this particular screw, I can tell already the palpation and the navigation is a little bit off. So we would have to re-register on a, on a real right. patient. And, and you've commented on palpation a uh, couple times. And I, I think that's very true. This is an assistive device that's not perfect. So you're always needing to confirm that it, it seems reasonable to you, right? So the surgeon is, is primary and this is just an assistive tool. It's not like you're going to follow up blindly. Yeah, so for this one, you know, I can tell already just the palpation, like you said, that it's definitely off, um, but just for the principles of showing the workflow. And then same thing, you can just pull this uh, Y wire out and you can proceed to the next level. Okay. Great, and uh, can you go through the process for an S2 ALR iliac? Just oh yeah, sure, give me one second. How do, you, how do I just pull this? While you're doing that, you know, uh, two other ways to do this besides the navigated jam sheet is a navigated alt tap tap and also in really osteoporotic yes. bone, and we tend to operate in older people with more osteoporotic bone now, uh, they have um, like one step screws. Uh, that have a sharp all tip, um, and you can navigate that directly. Um, there are a bunch of studies that show that if you don't tap, you have better pull-out strength. Uh, so that's another advantage of using navigation in, in these situations. So if we're doing uh, an S2AI screw, typically what you would end up doing is making a mini open uh, midline, and that's just because the angles are so steep that basically bilateral sides, they're gonna cross uh, each other near the midline. So I usually just make a mini open around the L5 spinous process. Um, so you can see right here, we're getting close to there. And then same thing, I think we saved us somewhat of a projection here. And then we just go through. And find our trajectory. And then it would be the same process of 
um, advancing with uh, the jam sheety, um, making sure you go past the, the cortices, and then I would drop a K wire or a Y wire. Um, for this one, we would tap uh, over the K wire that's navigated as well. Um, and then same thing, then we'd pass a navigated screw over that. So um, I, I could see it, it's midline, so a little bit different than our, our traditional lumbar or in sacral pedicle screws where it'd be paramedian. But with the screw extenders, you could fairly easy pass a rod. Is that your, what you would say? Yeah, so uh, usually it ends up being, yeah, definitely more medial. Yeah. When you have the tabs there, you, you just have to adjust it a little bit more, pushing them out. And so then that mini open in the midline really helps you. So you can really get your fi uh, finger deep into the wound to sort of palpate for the rod and adjust the tab uh, to uh, lateral, uh, since it's gonna have a very uh, medial to lateral pro uh, projection, the tab will stick out. And so you have to just fumble a little bit by just uh, with your finger and just uh, push it over to the, to the side where the rod's gonna go. I have a question about uh, in bigger segment fusions, like let's say L1 to S1 or L4 to S1. Obviously, every time you put a screw in, you change the anatomy. Every time you manipulate, you change the anatomy. In average, how many times do you have to re-register for a multi-level fusion? Can you repeat that last part? Um, the question is for multi-segmented fusion when you use the navigation and this system, in average, let's say from L1 to S1, how many times do you have to re-register or take new pictures and re-register? Uh, so if it's a, a fairly small, like three to four levels, uh, one, one scan, one registration should be good enough. And obviously we're checking the accuracy, either uh, bone-based on a spinous process or potentially a skin-based with those staples uh, technique. Uh, obviously if there's any uh, inaccuracy, then we'll re-register. Uh, sometimes what we'll have an issue is, for example, if you're going down to the pelvis, like in this scenario, um, uh, when I, oftentimes you may have to switch the spinous process tracker location um, if you're doing a longer segment just for ergonomics purposes. So oftentimes then I'm either re-spinning if, um, or uh, in some of the companies like this one here with Stryker, you can re-register based off of fiducial. So you can show where we had some point based on the, on the screen there. So I don't know if you wanna go back. Yeah, so we had, what we did was we first established certain markers like there, so like 0 0.1, 0 0.2. So we basically had these several spots, bony prominences, and then we can re-register. So you can get away with moving, if you bump into this um, tracker or you need to reposition it because of the ergonomic workflow, you can, re, you can spin this around as needed and then just re-register without doing a spin, which is one of the advantages of the system. Uh, so that's basically point-to-point -point, uh, registration instead of an automatic registration from the scan. Uh, so typically I can get away with just one scan for most of the times unless there's some serious error in the navigation or the registration system. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, we ha have a good experience here. I, I know Rock, uh, Vic, and I have used a lot of navigation. And normally for L1, S, S1 or Iliac, you don't really need to re-register typically um, because accuracy is fairly preserved. It's not like we're putting a cage in a disk space where we're, we're creating a shift. There's a little bit of motion, but the spine kind of resets with each screw placement, so it's not, typically not an issue, but this is just a good example of navigation could definitely be off. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing MIS, you may not notice it as well. So that, you know, the feeling of a screw going in, a, in, a, in good bone, looking kind of outside trajectory, make sure it looks reasonable. You need to always constantly check uh, accuracy. Um, otherwise, you get run into a real problem because you, you lose that visualization with minimally invasive and you're depending on navigation. Um, well, I, I, thanks. I, you know, I, I, I think this is a good example of where navigation obviously can be off. We had a very good talk by Karina earlier showing the accuracy of navigation, but again, that's the caveat that everything is working um, yep, well. Yeah, perfect. So, thanks. Um, do you have anything else? That I, oh, I think that's about okay. it. Yeah, just you know, verify, 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 as we talked about in the last few talks. Right, but when it works, it works very, quite well, and I think it's a time savings and a reduced radiation exposure to the surgeon. And so um, we're gonna take a quick lunch break. We're a little bit behind. Um, we'll reconvene in, uh, let, let's say, uh, f uh, 20 minutes. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll catch up, so 20 minutes from now, um, we'll restart with your talk on